All right, good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be with everyone. I will start off by welcoming you all. My name is uh, Mohammed Musa. I am a proud double alum of this great University of Toledo, MCO, and I am a practicing emergency medicine physician and residency program director. But today we're not here to listen about me. We're here to welcome all of you and our guests uh, and our panelists, but actually they're not panelists, they're leaders, they're champions and proud representatives of this uh, great uh, university under this uh, uh, platform of transforming the table, uh, a discussion, action and diversity here at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. Uh, we're so excited to um, have you join us today. Um, this webinar is hosted and uh, supported by the alumni affiliate of the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. And we are so excited to hear from everybody. Um, just to let you know that uh, all of our viewers are going to be muted just to make sure that uh, the flow in the, uh, of this webinar goes well. And if you have any questions, you know, just go ahead and enter them into the chat area and we'll try to include them throughout the hour. So there's a lot that we want to cover. Um, I do just want to mention all of our guests and uh, proud alumni first before I turn the reins over to um, Dr. Jenkins. I want to make sure and I'll give them more of an introduction later, but I'd like to welcome Dr. Altressa uh, Drummond. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark McKenzie. I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Ada Stewart, um, along with Dr. Jenkins, um, and uh, we really want to thank the staff for making this uh, event uh, possible. Uh, the discussion of diversity, I feel now is not just this extra thing out there. I feel like it is part of the ebb and flow of all of our daily lives and discussions in this country. Um, so I think it's very important to talk about it in terms of uh, medicine and our medical school and our practices. Uh, so, first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, uh, she is a friend and colleague of mine and all of ours. Um, she's an associate professor and associate dean of diversity, inclusion, and interim chair of anesthesiology here at the University of Toledo uh, College of Medicine and Life Sciences. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Michigan and obtained her MD degree at Wayne State University uh, Medical School in Detroit. And her residency in anesthesiology was completed at Wayne State. She, Dr. Jenkins, ha has been a faculty uh, here at the College of Medicine since 2007 and uh, received several department anesthesiology awards of excellence in teaching medical students. Um, in her role, she has um, uh, coordinated both the REACH program and the Toledo STARS pipeline programs for underserved students in the Toledo community. Uh, she's also served as a coordinator for the pre-matriculation orientation for incoming medical students, and it was a coordinator for the faculty student mentoring program. She is passionate about everything, uh, many things, and fostering an academic environment here at the college uh, that is welcoming and respectful in all the arenas of diversity inclusion and believes and has developed diversity training for the students. There's much, much more that can be said about Dr. Jenkins, but I'd like to officially welcome her and thank her for being with us. And we'd love to hear from you, Dr. Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you so much for that warm introduction and, and really welcome to everyone here. Uh, uh, this event is called Transform the Table, and there's a lot of discussion about having a seat at the table, but we're very, thankful about kind of shifting the dialogue um, to uh, deciding what's on the table, um, driving the discussion and leading the dialogue uh, at the table and really embracing uh, the leaders that we have within the College of Medicine and our distinguished uh, alumni and supporting them. Um, part of our strategic plan and vision is recruitment and retention. So supporting the students and faculty that are here uh, in achieving their um, professional and academic goals, and then connecting them with some of the 
trailblazers and pioneers and leaders uh, who were trained here and have gone on to do uh, quite wonderful things in our community uh, and in the field of medicine. Uh, next slide, please. We, um, in terms of, of, of driving the dialogue and conversation, we've had over 15 uh, events in our language of diversity lecture series um, and, and really hope to meet the needs, the social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion needs of our members so that when they want to have a dialogue about uh, uh, many of these issues, we provide them with the platform and the opportunity to engage. Um, next slide, please. And, and part of, um, of that discussion is really, is really supporting uh, the students while they're here. I always say in terms of recruitment is a short bridge to cross when you support the students, uh, support their endeavors while they're here, give them the uh, mentorship and guidance that they need to be successful. There's a short bridge to cross between that and then them eventually choosing uh, the College of Medicine uh, for their uh, uh, their next step in training and their career endeavors. So we support um, Student National Medical Association, SNMA, um, and really help to foster the leadership potential within our students here. Next slide, please. And we also uh, support the Physician Assistant Diversity Association, White Coats for Black Lives, which has um, over 300 members. Next slide and our Black Graduate Student Association, among many, many other organizations. And, and one of the um, challenges that we have is that we have these students uh, who have you know, unlimited potential, and we're trying to connect them with leaders in the community who will mentor and guide them. And sometimes we have a, a shallow pool to draw from. And so we're really trying to, to widen that net so that they can see themselves in these uh, roles and, and leadership roles in medicine. Again, not just being happy to be here, but finding a way to, to find leadership roles and to kind of innovate and carve out new paths in medicine. Um, it's, it's a challenge to do that on your own. It's, it's, it's much more preferential to connect a, a young student with someone who's already you know, been there before. And so that's one of uh, the driving um, uh, motivations when we have these types of discussions and, and outreach. Next slide, please. And um, and another way, you know, there's a um, when I think about empower, empowering our students and our faculty and engaging them, uh, the quote from Eli Weisel comes to mind where he says that uh, service is just the rent you've got to pay for your room here on earth. So in terms of them seeing themselves and, and having mentors who have already uh, you know, uh, found leadership roles in our community, it's also important for them to see themselves in the lives of young uh, students who are underserved, marginalized, those students who are first generation college, uh, coming from social economically disadvantaged backgrounds or underrepresented uh, minorities. Um, so in this way, we really empower our students uh, and our learners in mentoring uh, through our pipeline programs, our high school pipeline programs. Uh, we have them throughout the year. We have an upcoming summer program in just a couple weeks. And this really gives them a purpose behind uh, some of the pain of their academic journey. And, and we certainly um, encourage our faculty to participate in these programs as well. Next slide. And, and this just really gives us an opportunity um, for, for students to connect some of their challenges and their stories with those up and coming students whose dream it is uh, to pursue medicine. So without further ado, um, we're, we're just so thankful to have our distinguished panelists here today. Um, we are thankful to have, uh, give them the opportunity to tell their story a little bit about your journey uh, in medicine, uh, through training and beyond, and, and really happy to engage uh, with you and connect um, your story with uh, some of the students and faculty within the College of Medicine now. So thank you.
thank you, Dr. Jenkins, uh, for that wonderful presentation and overview of what's trying to be done here. And I agree. I hope, like you described, that hopefully that shallow pool will become a deep pool of mentors and advisors uh, for students that are uh, up and coming uh, in this route. Um, great, thank you. So I would like to next introduce Dr. Uh, Altressa uh, Drummond. Um, it's my honor to introduce her. She was born, uh, born and raised in Lorain, Ohio, just outside Cleveland, I imagine, right? I developed a desire to become a physician during her senior year in high school, developed an interest in medicine due to her fascination with the complexities of the human body and the ever evolving field of medicine, resulting in constant learning and growth in job security. Um, these two factors prompted her decision to pursue a career as a physician. She obtained a BA in biology at the University of Toledo and an MD at the Medical College of Ohio, MCO, uh, and she completed her internship and residency here at the University of Toledo Medical Center. Was a, she was a hemodialysis technician. Bless you for that. Wow. And for years before applying for medical school, decided upon internal medicine to do inpatient work solely to obtain what she thought would be a work-life balance. Uh, worked as a full-time hospitalist for nine years, uh, a locums attendance hospitalist, and those of you on the call that don't know what locums tenants is, that's like kind of like working all over the place for days at a time, weeks at a time, traveling uh, and supporting those uh, hospitals around the country. Uh, she did that for five years and then uh, returned to full time for two more years. Uh, organized a blood drive for her church, participated in the Barron Middle School Careers Day for three years and participated in medical missions to Ethiopia with Joyce Meyer Ministries, a life-changing and powerful experience. Uh, she plans to return to Ethiopia to participate in medical missions in a few years under God's continuous guidance. Uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Altressa Drummond. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to participate in uh, the virtual meeting Thank you for having me. Um, as you know, I obtained my BA in, at the University of Toledo in biology, and I did work for a few years as a hemodialysis technician, and I um, decided to finally pursue my dream of becoming a physician um, at the age of 30. Someone recommended that I um, reach out to Dr. Barry Richardson, who, um, provided uh, recommendations on uh, acceptance, gaining acceptance into medical school. And I started there in 97. Um, I appreciate how they provided uh, mentors of uh, medical students a year ahead of us to give uh, recommendations and tips on how to study effectively and succeed in um, the first year of medical school. I also um, noticed how they randomly assigned us um, in groups for gross anatomy and for the clerkships in uh, the third and fourth years of medical school, which expanded my um, friends or um, connections, so to speak. I was a member of the SNMA and I appreciated how we planned get, you know, time to study uh, together and social um, events to decompress, which was very helpful. There were some who were gracious enough to provide um, recommendations and advice on how to uh, succeed uh, for the clerkship programs during the third and fourth years. I was also a member of the um, Christian Medical and Dental Association where we did Bible study and prayer, which strengthened and encouraged me uh, during the uh, tough times in, in medical school. I noticed my first year of medical school, there were a lot of clicks, but by the fourth year, we were all, there was a, a sense of fellowship and, and we were helping each other, providing recommendations and 
you know, distributing study materials or what have you uh, to help us to succeed in, in those clerkship programs. I um, also, let's see, give me a moment here. Um, for, I would recommend, what I would do differently in medical school is to take uh, full advantage of the um, the resources that UT has, that, that they provide. I regret not um, utilizing my um, medical student more uh, for studying smarter uh, during my first year. Um, I um, also appreciate UT when I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer shortly after match day. And the place that I matched at uh, could not provide the uh, medical um, treatment or coverage that I needed. And so I did residency and intern internship and residency at um, UT and they provided full coverage for the surgeries and the um, chemo and radiation therapies that I needed. And they also um, placed me on a light schedule my first year there because they knew that I would be um, not up to the, the grueling schedule of internship while undergoing chemo and radiation therapy. Um, they were right. Um, I noticed and I would recommend when you match finding a good um, study guide for your boards and just utilizing that um, resource every year, just going over it so that when you uh, complete your residency, you will be well prepared for the boards and it will provide a um, firm and steady, a good foundation uh, for you, your knowledge in your career. Um, the BRS series for med school was very helpful uh, to me as well. And I would recommend that you take care of yourself. You eat healthy, um, take the time to do that and to exercise, you know, at least three to four times a week because that will, will also help you to be sharp mentally and physically to um, withstand the um, rigorous emotional and physical um, standards expected of medical, of residents and physicians. And, and to start the financial, um, planning financially from day one of um, your, atten you know, when you become an attending, have that savings and um, 401k or IRA from, from the start and look into, you know, getting into a side hustle as they call it, something that you enjoy doing that, that could also um, provide additional income. And, and in my case, um, Jesus made the difference for me. Um, he placed the right people in my pathway and, and just, I just felt strength and and encouragement uh, to press on uh, during the rough times because there will be. And 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 you're human. If if you need help, be it with studying smarter, um, get the help. There's there's mentors out there um, that are willing to to help. And I wish I had taken advantage of that during my first year. And. If, if you are, you know, stressed or burned out, even if it, it means, you know, seeking help, counseling, psychiatry or what have you, don't try to, to go it alone or don't try to tough it out because it it may only get worse. And, and just to to just seek the help that you need early on and, and address the issue so that you can put it behind you and continue moving forward. Um, is, is what I would, would recommend. 
and I thank you for, for this opportunity once again. Thank you uh, so very much, Dr. Uh, Drummond. We really appreciate uh, your experiences and advice. I think you provide a very realistic path uh, for a lot of students that are coming through the pipeline that um, you don't have to go through the traditional route to become a doctor or a nurse. Uh, there are alternative pathways. And I bet when you uh, became a nurse and became a hemodialysis nurse at the beginning, you weren't initially thinking that you'd be a doctor one day, but um, the fact that you had a determination to do it is inspiring, I think, for a lot of students who may be listening to this. So thank you for sharing your story. And if we all talk about the hardships, I think we're not doing our students who are listening a favor because we all have them. So thank you very much, and that's very helpful. Um, so continue on with our program, I'd like to, um, Welcome again, Dr. Um, Ada Stewart. Is she back yet? Or um, I knew she had to drop off. If not, um, yeah, we got a message, Dr. Musa, that she has to testify on the floor of the house, which is a pretty impressive thing to have to leave for. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, let's uh, move on a little bit. Maybe we can come back after she's uh, uh, done with that, if that's a possibility. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone who's listening to this program, please enter your questions in the chat box um, and then we can incorporate them as we uh, move forward. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Mark McKenzie, are you, uh, can I give you a little introduction and then we'll uh, move on to you? Yes, All right. Sir. So everybody would like to know a little bit about you. So uh, Dr. Mark McKenzie is the regional medical director and principal investigator at the ClinSearch in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's a medical research site that is currently conducting COVID-19 treatments and prevention studies. Amazing. He has been an investigator in over 200 clinical trials for various medical therapies and is a principal investigator for both uh, Moderna, Novavax, COVID vaccine research trials. And uh, Dr. Uh, McKenzie previously owned and operated a private internal medicine practice and also served as the medical director for Cigna. Wow. Uh, has been providing health care in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area for the last uh, uh, 19 years. Uh, Dr. McKenzie holds a BA in biology and a BS, uh, Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology from Southern uh, Adventist University in Tennessee. And he received his medical doctor degree from none other, the University of Toledo, Go Rockets, uh, Medical College of Ohio uh, in 2000. I started medical school in 2000, you left in 2000, um, and also did his internal medicine residency there. Uh, Dr. McKenzie is passionate about consumer health care and believes that education and appropriate access uh, to resources are vital to uh, the well-being of all. Uh, help me in welcoming Dr. McKenzie, and we'd love to hear your story. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. You um, started uh, at the uh, University of Toledo, well, Medical College of Ohio back then in the mid 90s. And uh, when I came to school, which was interesting, a uh, non traditional student was married with one nine month old child. And during medical school, we actually had two more kids there. The, as uh, Dr. Drummond was talking, I'm reminded of some of the things I tried to do, toughing it out on my own. My sec second child was in the ICU at St. Vincent's for the first six. Uh, uh, weeks of her life and trying to do biochemistry at the same time of sitting in the ICU next to her uh, uh, in, in, in bed there was one of the toughest things I did, but um, being uh, stubborn and what I thought was brave, I didn't tell any of my professors. I remember eventually mentioning it to one of my mentors, Dr. Mary Smith, and she directed me to Dr. Gohara, who said, what are you trying to do? Let us slow some things down for you until she's out of the woods and then you can get back on schedule, which is what I did and um, caught up within a few months uh, with the rest of my class. But that's a lesson learned. Communicate with your professors, let them know what's going on. Sometimes personally, you want to keep that to yourself. And as having a family, a young family, I was trying to do that and of course be successful, but uh, spending your days in, in school and then uh, any other extra time I had at the hospital is no way to be successful in in, uh, in uh, med school. I did get through and as I was mentioned, I did my residency there. 
I back up to prior to medical school, I was a medical technologist. If you know what that is, there were the people who do your lab testing in the hospitals or other clinical labs for providers, physicians, and, and others. Um, and always had a pension for lab. Um, when I was there at, uh, in Toledo, Dr. Gunning, who's a pathology uh, professor there, and uh, Dr. Smith had hematology research that I was privileged to become a part of working on something called dense granule deficiency. I was honored to go to the American Society of Hematology National Meeting and present a poster and also did that later on for um, the ACP meeting. Uh, it was in Atlanta then. So in my head, and part of what I always liked about medicine was the study of how things work and what to do, and also thinking of therapies um, with that. After um, medical school came down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, my first two job offers and for a re after residency were down here and uh, I settled in a group practice and eventually had my own uh, independent practice. I did get the opportunity to spend a couple of years as a medical director, as was mentioned for an insurance company that was more of a, a, uh, a trial run. I liked it, but uh, I missed dealing with people and directly and went back into practice and eventually um, closed the practice to do research full time. I mentioned that because one of the things that I, I recognize in entering medical school, many of us don't know the options of what physicians can do. And the research career that I currently enjoy was not really something that was highlighted. I was intent on becoming a, a, a primary care physician running my own business or part of a group business. And I would think the, the piece that um, sometimes we don't recognize is there are other areas of medicine that qualified doctors can, and can do something with. And that includes being a supporter for an insurance company, working for a pharmaceutical company, doing research on your own, or even academics as, as some of you are very familiar with, and also private practice. The business of medicine is one of the things that uh, we got a little bit of when I was there in Toledo, but I think more schools should push that. As a doctor, you finish residency and you don't really know all the ins and outs of how insurance works, how you get paid, the work you do, the time you, you have. And there, there are some private physicians there who can mentor on that aspect, but would love to see academically that be part of the regular curriculum. And mind you, I don't know if that's what you get there if you get any of that, but um, it's something I've always encouraged students or residents that I talk to to pursue some business education as they go through. My mentors, um, Dr. Mary Smith, Dr. Barry Richardson, Dr. William Gun Gunning or Bill Gunning were my three mentors. And it's Dr. Smith and Dr. Gunning were the ones doing hematology research together that I got attached to. And so it's kind of nice to find myself back in the research niche that I, I played with before and doing what I do now. How does this relate to our topic today? In clinical research, the history of research in the United States of America has a hard time in positive stories related to those who are uh, ethnically diverse, Black, African American, other minorities. Unfortunately, there are some bad stories that we're all fairly well aware of and others that we're not. That is instructive because the, the, the therapies that you learn to use as a doctor um, in training and doctors that are out in practice, the therapies that they use or we use need willing participants to get fully evaluated. The COVID studies that we've done all this last year and are still doing, one of the things that we had to intentionally do was try to garner enough diverse uh, uh, enough diversity in our, our volunteers. You know, initially our vaccine trial, one of them, we had quite a bit of enrollment, but it was from the, the local majority uh, population. The sponsor and the FDA recommended slowing everything down to intentionally include a uh, more diverse population. We were able to achieve that. So one of the things that I do as an investigator and medical director is I am able to 
use my platform to encourage the volunteers from uh, various backgrounds to make sure that the medicines we're testing have their input as to how it works, how they tolerate it. So the information you get when you're ready to submit to uh, an FDA uh, evaluation includes diverse uh, uh, people who've used the medicine, who've tried the medicine, and that we have safety data on. It gives you confidence that these things work. I also speak to local groups about research, trying to uh, destigmatize it. It's been really good for the media uh, exposure of the last year as to what clinical research is about and how we do it, the different phases, and who gets included and who doesn't. Um, but it's also brought a lot of questions and conspiracy theories that we've had to spend uh, time um, getting rid of or, or dealing with. And to me, it's been an honor. And I enjoy the education. Um, you can't win every fight and you shouldn't try to, but giving facts, being able to look people in the eye with my background, my, my education, my experience, and talk to them plainly so they can understand what uh, clinical medicine is about, clinical research is about, um, is a positive thing. My, my start, really because of Toledo, having the experiences I did there, the mentors I did who had an interest in me, my family. Um, as I mentioned, I had uh, started med school with one, one child, nine months old. We had two more in school and actually one in residency when I was there. So four kids um, grew up through med school and residency with us and uh, thankful that uh, for the time, the patience, the support that I had there in Toledo. Again, the message, talk to your professors, talk to each other. It does make a difference. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. McKenzie. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, you know, yeah, you're thinking about the other opportunities you have as a medical student resident, becoming a physician, and working for companies and organizations, um, not just thinking of the clinical aspect. There are other routes that you're uh, obviously uh, teaching and talking about. So thanks for opening up our eyes to that because we probably don't mention that enough. And then the business side of medicine absolutely needs to be taught more and pushed more and definitely a diversity component in that as well. Um, what I would like to do now is I do want to read the bio introduction of uh, Dr. Ada Stewart. She's testifying on the floor of the House. I'm not sure if that means Congress or a state thing, but I'm sure whatever she is testifying about, she's advocating on behalf of all of us in some way, shape or form. So let me just read a little bit about her, if you don't mind. Um, uh, so <clears throat> Dr. Ada Stewart is a family physician with uh, Cooperative Health in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, is president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Ah, that makes a lot of The AAFP represents 133,500 physicians and medical students nationwide. Um, as the AAFP president, um, Dr. Stewart advocates on behalf of family physicians and patients to inspire positive change in the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, Dr. Stewart's been practicing fa uh, family physician with Cooperative Health, formerly Eau Claire Cooperative Health Center, since 2012, um, and currently serves as leader, lead provider, and HIV specialist. Uh, Dr. Stewart is also a member of the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Um, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and the National Medical Association, uh, and the American Medical Women's Association. Uh, born and reared in an underserved urban area of Cleveland, Ohio, Stewart was Dr. Stewart was committed has committed her career to ensuring uninsured and low income families have access to high quality health care. And in the aftermath of September 11, 2001. Uh, Dr. Stewart enlisted in the U.S. Army Reserves and has achieved the rank of Colonel. Uh, and Dr. Stewart earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacy from Ohio Northern University in Ada, Ohio, uh, realizing she wanted to have a more direct impact on patients' lives and well-being. Uh, she returned to school, uh, completing her medical degree at the Medical College of Ohio and her family medicine residency training at Palmetto Richland Memorial Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. So. If Dr. Stewart does come back on, we'll circle her back in uh, so she can uh, speak. But I, I kind of want to uh, just ask a general question to everybody. 
Um, so how and why, uh, if our panelists can answer this, how and why is diversity important in medicine and med medical training? I don't mind sharing first. I would think from my experience, um, part of what I was trying to communicate with the research angle, um, when you're actually in practice, there are a lot of things you recognize that are not culturally equal. When I'm talking to a patient from a certain background, that same discussion doesn't necessarily apply to somebody from a different background. So being able to communicate in the language that is appropriate, whether it be the medical history, whether it be the, the religious background, the nationality, ethnicity, the types of uh, things that they would consider normal, even though that may not match what I, my personal experience is, being able to communicate to them in a language or in a way that they understand and can appreciate um, I think is key. So diversity in medical school, I think adds to that. You have people from various backgrounds sharing different ideas. Diversity in leadership adds to that. Diversity in, in the communities in which we serve and the different roles we play. Um, if you think of um, my current uh, uh, focus, um, that's part of why diversity matters. Historically, you would have testing on, on, on medications that were monolithic. Uh, one type of person, a, a typically a white male, was the the subject, and then we try to apply that to everybody. That is not the case anymore. We do in th things intentionally to diversify who we test on, and including spreading these uh, studies around the world. So diversity, I think, in med school and medicine in general is very important. Dr. Jenkins, can you add anything to that, please? I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, we really draw on the richness of diversity in our experiences and, and backgrounds. And we use this as an asset in providing the needs of the diverse patient population we serve. So ultimately it, it comes down to uh, who we are serving, you know, having um, a diversity of, um, among uh, across several spectrums, you know, it's, we recruit for our students, for example, students from underrepresented minority backgrounds, social economically disadvantaged backgrounds. We know that that helps us to better meet the needs of, of our patient population. So as opposed to, as you said, Dr. Musa, this being something that's an add on, it's really integral to us providing excellence and really fulfilling our mission in research, in education, and of course, in, in patient care. And I'm just really inspired by um, our panelists here because every experience that they've had, whether being non-traditional background, dealing with medical challenges, coming from underserved, marginalized communities, has served them well in their practice and given them more tools and more resources to offer uh, in, in their medical practice. Great, great. Um, Dr. McKinsey, I want to ask you a specific question. I think many people might be wondering um, in terms of diversity and medicine in our patients. Um, a lot of it see, I don't I don't say a lot, it seems like many patients of diverse, underserved, or underrepresented population are hesitant or suspicious of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, can you address that a little bit and talk about that? It might be helpful in this forum. Yeah, I think that's very good. Actually, one of the better um, resources, if you're looking for a book, is something called Medical Apartheid. Apartheid. I think um, it's a good read for a lot of us to consider the history of medicine. If you know the history of medical research and medical care in this country, it allows you to empathize or listen to those concerns from, from, from that background. One of the things I've done is over the last, you know, since last summer, maybe 30 or more town halls via Zoom or in person. I just did another one at a local church on Sunday. And the point of that is for to allow a community to ask me questions about research. The suspicion comes from the history. 
And then the hesitancy, when you see something, unfortunately, in this day and age, when we were in school, we didn't have Instagram and Facebook wasn't a thing, but now people get a lot of their information through social media and their ideas are formulated that way. If it was on any media of any sort, it must be true. So to allow them a chance to verbalize questions that they have, that they received um, on, on online or in social media somehow, is a way to deal with that. The idea that you're being researched on, quote unquote, we're testing things on you to, to see if it works, but we're not protecting your safety. That we try to dispel that. The things that it's going to, the vaccine in particular, it's gonna change your DNA using some method that we know from science doesn't match what the, 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 the story is out there, that somehow you're being tracked Talking plainly to some of those uh, ideas is something we we deal with. I had somebody ask me about the chip that you know is in the nanoparticle in the vaccine, and he was holding his phone while he was talking to me, and so I had to point out, accept his his statement, explain the signs to him why that didn't fit with what I know, and then explain to him about the idea that his phone is more of a tracking device than anything we deal with. In, in the vaccines or, or anything like that. So the, the hesitancy is fair. It comes from history, um, but trying to deal with facts and how the vaccines have helped, especially vaccines that they've already taken, you know, MR, um, the uh, MMR and those types of things that people have successfully taken and what it's done for society and using that to help us with this push to get more people uh, protected. Great, uh, thank you. And once again, we wanted to welcome all of our uh, participants who are on the uh, uh, call here. If you have any questions, please submit them in the chat uh, box. But um, just a general question here. Um, if you could go back to medical school, and this is for our panel, um, what would be one thing that you would, you would do differently? Um, Kind of a big question, I know, but uh, um, I, I let me if I if you don't mind, I'll add my angle. What I would do is I would I would try to slow down and take a deep breath and realize that you don't always have to be in the grind to make decisions. You can slow down and 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 see the options and ask more. Ask more questions would be my thing. Ask everybody, anybody, questions about anything. Um, I think that's one thing I would. Um, I do. Anybody else in the panel have suggestions? Yeah, probably two things. I think it was mentioned already the idea of communicating with your professors, being transparent. You know, those of us who have things going on in life, find some key people in in this in the staff that you feel comfortable with and talk to them. They can be advocates for you. I, I believe the professors are there to help you, not to fail you out of medical school. So it, that's worth it. But the other thing that I noticed, and this was personally, I did not protect my health enough. I did not exercise. I, you know, didn't prioritize that. You know, in my mind, I was juggling medical school and then juggling a family. But my health suffered by not exercising regularly. And I think while we say it and we end up preaching it when we're out in practice. In med school, a lot of us don't actually take care of ourselves in the way we should. That I would do differently. I know I certainly would shake off that so called imposter syndrome earlier. And you do that by uh, seeking out mentors and, you know, kind of defining your role for yourself and. Um, and, and not necessarily uh, aligning your vision of yourself with how others perceive you. So, you know, when you're here, and we have to reiterate this a lot with our students, that you're here for a reason and you deserve to be here. And not only just to, to be happy to be here to show up, but you have an opportunity to, to really carve out uh, your own path and, and really find your own voice. So, you know, there's just value in all of our struggles and challenges, but I think, you know, it's really important for uh, students to feel empowered and to feel 
that they're worthy and, and deserving to be in the place that they are at the time that they are. And I, I'd love to ask Dr. Drummond too a little bit about how uh, she dealt with some of the health challenges and, you know, kind of piggybacking on that idea of resilience that is really uh, pushed on, you know, uh, as, as a as a big issue for our students and faculty, but how did she kind of deal with that in the midst of her academic uh, challenges? Is Dr. Drummond still on the call? If she is, we'd love to hear from her. I'm not sure she is. Great, excellent, excellent addition, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you. Um, so, um, and you know, another another topic that came up uh, with this discussion is um, how do you? There's a there's a misconception out there that when you talk about diversity and you are more inclusive to others, um, it's somehow taking away from the the the, the whole pie, like the, the people who are not necessarily of diverse background. How do you square that circle and educate? Uh, colleagues and friends that just because someone is rising from a diverse background doesn't mean it's taken anyone else's position or spot. I'm not sure if I expressed that clearly. Um, can you speak to that, uh, Dr. McKenzie? I'm going to actually defer to Dr. Uh, Jenkins for that one, but yeah, I, I I always think, and and I think it was mentioned, the more people involved with um, a, an issue, a subject, a community. It it uh, benefits everyone. I can't dictate for my neighbor what's what. In a relationship, hearing their opinion and allowing them to hear mine, um, considering ourselves equal, is a positive outcome as opposed to one person dictating. And so, if you spread that across a group, I'm hearing a different story from everyone around me and how they hear my story um, may be different person to person. So just as in, in, in a medical situation, uh, uh, medical therapy, I can treat one person's diabetes one way and another person's diabetes, the same numbers a different way because their background, their understanding, their lifestyle, their resources, their belief system is completely different. And to be fair to each, having to consider that I think is 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 appropriate. I and mean, it starts with learning and then also teaching and allowing for another view on that. So we have Dr. Stewart back. Yes, Dr. Stewart is back. Excellent. Um Dr. Stewart, uh, we, I, we, we talked a little bit about you already. We presented you, so we just want to hear from you. Please let us know if, you, if you're allowed to tell us what you were testifying about, and we'd love to hear your experience um, uh, in medical school, and uh, we'd love to hear your story. Thank you so very much. So, so appropriate. Uh, I just had to testify uh, before the uh, AMA House of Delegates on an issue near and dear to what we're talking about today, and that is um, systemic racism and how now the AMA is um, working at having a task force to be able to address this very issue. As we talk about, um, you know, issues as far as advancing health equity, uh, it's really important that we have folks that are able to um, really have the opportunity to talk about racism uh, and the impact that it has on our patients, on our community. And um, uh, I was really honored to uh, have this opportunity to be able to be with you all today, but uh, also uh, honored to, to be able to, to testify before uh, the important uh, House of Medicine that uh, I just had the opportunity to do. Uh, one thing I, I want to say, um, and I don't know, I'm, I miss most of this uh, important conversation and dialogue that we had. Um, and I was asked, you know, um, 
uh, about my time as a medical student there at uh, Medical College of Ohio. And the one thing, as I reflected back on, on my journey, I would not be able to do what uh, I'm doing today uh, had it not been for the support uh, of many individuals there at uh, MCO, uh, my classmates, uh, and many of uh, the uh, faculty and staff that were there. Uh, they were very, very, very supportive of all the things that I wanted to, to do as far as changing the, uh, the dialogue and, and changing. And, and it's important that we talk about transforming the table. Uh, we truly need to transform uh, the table, and I'm really um, impressed and uh, very enlightened that um, you all have uh, taken this opportunity uh, for us to be able to have this conversation. Uh, I think about the fact that, you know, we all have to recognize that um, diversity is needed. Diversity and inclusion is needed uh, if we're going to uh, best be able to take care of our communities, which are diverse. Uh, there's been studies that show that individuals fare better. They do better when they are treated by people who look like them. And so we really have to make sure that we address the pipeline. And I was really impressed with the uh, pipeline program that you all are having. Uh, because again, as I look even at myself, and, and I think about what uh, the former Surgeon General, Dr. Uh, Joycelyn Elders once said, you can't be what you don't see. So we need to make sure that we are able to have mentors, uh, people that look like the folks that we really want to uh, encourage uh, to go into medicine. And uh, uh, that's the only way that we're going to be able to achieve health equity. We saw the impact during this pandemic that we had as far as health disparities are concerned, and uh, we need to continue, continue this hard work. So uh, I apologize again, but uh, I'm very honored and privileged to have the opportunity uh, to do what I do best. And, uh, and that's making sure that uh, our voices are heard and that we are changing, uh, again, transforming the table uh, that has been uh, placed before us and making sure that we have the opportunity for those to not only sit at the table, but also be able to invite it, to be invited, to be able to eat, to be able to break bread together. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Stewart, your testifying actually enriched this uh, this table uh, because it tells us how and what you're doing uh, on behalf of all of us and our students in the future. Uh, so that was great, great timing. Actually, I, I would not call it an interruption at all. Um, so can you do that again next time? <laughs> uh, uh, so I just wanted to make sure we include also Dr. Drummond again. Dr. Drummond, if you had any uh, final thoughts, I can't believe how fast this hour is going by. We wanted to unmute you and get you in on this discussion again. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Okay, um, in regards to the first question regarding um, the diversity, I felt uh, from my standpoint, I uh, was also given the opportunity to uh, provide care to non-Blacks who had reservations about allowing uh, a minority to participate in their care, changing their perception of um, the capabilities of Black physicians. Uh, that was an awesome, that's an awesome opportunity for me. And as far as uh, my illness, um, my faith, made the difference and the supportive um, staff of the medical college. They went out of their way to make sure that I received the care that I needed and that um, I did not fall too far behind while receiving it um, with during my training. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you. For that, uh, and what I would like to do now, as we're kind of concluding this session, is open it up for anyone to say anything about this discussion, uh, transforming the table event. Um, I really sincerely hope. Uh, I'm happy that this is the second one in our series, and uh, we plan on doing this in the future more. 
Um, any final thoughts uh, before I turn it over to uh, Marcus, who will uh, close us out? Uh, thanks again for including me. I'm happy to share the story. I think this is a very important topic, something that mattered to me when I was there in school has mattered to me throughout my career. Um, we've had similar experiences in, in dealing with these issues, uh, those of us on the panel, and I know as uh, medical students, residents, and others, um, you will have that potential, uh, ex those experiences as well. And to be able to speak positively and show others that you can make a difference in the community, make a difference uh, with those you deal with one-on-one, -on -one and be a positive example. I like the idea that if you don't see it, you're not likely to be it. Um, and being an example for others is uh, something I take very seriously. Thank you for allowing me to participate today. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists and, and of course, Dr. Musa as well for, for uh, moderating this discussion. I just wanted to say, this is the conversation that I needed to hear as a student. And I'm very grateful uh, to hear your voices. I wish we could go on and on and we will be inviting you back um, for a longer discussion. Um, but this is, this is a needed conversation and it's really wonderful to connect our young student leaders with, with, the, with the leaders uh, in our alumni uh, class. Thank you. Absolutely. And everyone should know that this is being recorded. We will post this online for it to share this more and more. Uh, Marcus, it's to you now. But can you hear me? Perfect. Um, wow, that was this was. I'm I'm literally speeches. This was a fantastic event. Um, and, and Dr. Musa, you said this earlier, it's, these individuals are not panelists, they're leaders. So thank you for all our leaders um, for cutting out time to t share your stories, share your advice, share um, this wisdom upon all of yours um, and the future viewers when we email this out. Um, again, my name is Marcus Snee. I work with the College of Medicine and Life Sciences. And I just wanna say to everyone who's listening, viewing us. Thank you so much for participating. Um, this is our second um, event. The goal of this particular event is to show, you know, that we have amazing, amazing leaders who uh, who attended the College of Medicine and Life Sciences. They are doing awesome things in the world. And this right here is this is it's, this is shows everything that our, our alumni are doing. Um, and the other part was to you know, create opportunities for our students to be able to see, see that, hey, I can do the same thing that these alums are doing when I graduate. And also, you know, we're going to provide opportunities for, for mentor, mentors. Um, this has been, uh, it's been already said several times how important a mentor is. I had a mentor. I didn't go to college medicine, I'm, but I mean, I'm a graduate and I have mentors. I still have mentors now that I Call, call and ask questions all the time. Um, those are those individuals are very important for our growth. And so we want to make sure we buy opportunities for our students to have mentors. And this is why we want to also to put this particular event on. And so again, thank you so much for everyone joining. Um, stay tuned. We will continue the series um, uh, in the future. And so please stay tuned and, and join if you can. And um, if you, um, I will provide my information in the chat box, my phone number and um, email address. So if you are looking for a mentor and, or if you want to be a mentor, um, please contact me and we will work to find one for you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you everyone. Appreciate it and talk soon. Bye.